going to resume the recording. Okay, so you see my program up there. I'm just going to yes. open, open up a random flute, um, one of the starter flutes. Um, so a D flute, now you see the screen's populated. And give it, again, the same uh, default tuning file. Now you see the tuning file. And let's just assume we're doing um, a group toll size and position. Most people use, use that. Um, OK, so you see that. And then this is the constraints view that you're seeing now. Everybody see that fine? Yes. Yep. OK, um, you see that second line where, where my cursor is, is, is popping is that ratio of splitting edge from top hole position to bore length. I live on that, on that ratio. Um, and so independent of um, direction holes, when I'm just starting to tune a flute, so I have a flute, no holes in it, um, but voiced, and it's a little bit longer um, than I intended to be. Um, I first go in and, and determine the fibble factor. Then I'll I'll run it after I've and everybody's comfortable with that, and everybody does that. I do that on every single flute that I make, and I also keep track of those flutes, those fibble factors. Um, for different geometries, because I need that number when I first lay out for my bore tapers, um, so I get the tapers right. And I I pretty much put a bore taper in every single flute that I make, uh, no matter what the key. Um, so then I'll run a test. It, I'll, I'll and and. and Speak up if, if you want to ask a question as I'm going through this. I don't want this to be a monologue. Um, okay, uh, I have a quick one. Let me just pop in here. Yes. Uh, on, on, on FIPPLE Factor. Um, if we are calculating, uh, let's say I want to make a dozen blanks at one time. Okay. Uh, and they're all cylindrical. Um, is FIPPLE Factor going to be static? relative to whether I'm going to use tuning holes or, or uh, change the tuning in any way. Can I figure that out? Tuck, tuck uh, you know, uh, a post-it into the bore of the flute and put it aside for later and uh, know that that FIPPLE factor is going to work regardless of whether I'm going to tune that to a, let's say a, uh, 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 an E flat or an E, both of which would use a one inch bore. So what, what I found is that as I'm cutting the flute off, so I keep measuring the fipple factor because I'm anal. Um, as uh -huh. I'm cutting the, the flute off yep. to length to, to get it in tune, but it'll change a little bit. And the reason uh -huh. why it changes is not any issue with the, the calculations. It's because the shorter flutes to get a nice clear bell tone, which is what you're trying for, um, as you're voicing it before you've added finger holes, will be a little bit louder in volume. You can push your your breath pressure a little bit more, and it makes it a little bit sharper, and that's reflected in the fipple factor. Uh -huh. So that that's the the vagary. You'll also find that you've made your series of six flutes or whatever. And you measure a fipple factor for each one. It's not going to be identical for that same reason. As you're blowing through the flute, right. you're going to assess what is the best tone quality and breath pressure that you're going to use for that particular flute as, as you're tuning it. And that's going to be different for each flute, depending on how uh, perfectly identical your splitting edges are in geometry and position, things like that. So your fipple factor changes a little bit, not a lot. And you can do some what ifs with the program and 
uh, see how much a little bit of change in FIPL factor um, will affect whole layout as opposed to just changing your whole size. And there, there's a little bit of leeway. In okay. In, in terms of FIPL factor, we, we set this range of what is it, uh, point, point 0.2 to 1.5. Um, and I noticed uh, most of yours come in at about 0.75 yep. um, in the tutorials. They're, um, they're is, fairly standard for me. And, and, and what I have found is that tunability seems to work out best when you're pretty close to the center uh, uh, of the range. And, and I've had some flutes where, you know, I'll start out with a presumed fipple factor in the design, come up with a beautiful flute, and then uh, the TSH ends up being a little large. Uh, it seems to push fipple factor higher, and then the flute is difficult to get correctly in tune. Um, is as uh, a craftsmanship issue, should we be really looking to try to get um, right into the center of that zone? No. Or is that a stylistic thing? Um, it's, it's so internal to the program, what the FIPL factor is, is it's just a multiplier that takes the area of uh, the TSH and multiplies it by that FIPL factor. So it's the amount that, that that TSH is hooded by the rest of your geometry. Uh huh. And so it's going to be a lower number if you're using a big chimney compared to if you're not using a chimney at all. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and both flutes will sound just fine. It's just the, the FIPL factor will, will be different. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tend to make a spreadsheet and I say, okay, this um, flute is going to have a, a big chimney on it. And this flute is not. And so I can set my fickle factor before I start cutting wood uh, based upon that, that intent. Okay, I have other people trying to join, so I'm gonna unshare and then share for some reason. I, I need to seem to be able, nope, nobody else is, is trying to come in, so I'll go back to sharing. So did I answer your question on, on, on FIPL factor? Um, that uh, keep track of that, especially if you're using um, direction holes. I, from the video, you have two choices. For direction holes, you can either use the FIPL factor that you've determined from similar flutes, or before you've drilled the holes to make your direction mm -hmm. holes, or um, you can measure the 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 tone that's coming out and um, determine the FIPL factor for that flute. It's you, you do one or the other, and I I I don't have that much experience doing direction holes because, like I say, I rarely use them. Uh -huh. Okay. The only place that I standardly use them is making drones, where I want to uh -huh. tweak, tweak the tuning. But then again, um, I'm gonna just hold up a flute. Uh, if you see one of these flutes, this is a big A. Um, this little little tab that you're seeing, that's my splitting edge. I can move it back and forth. So I don't have quite as fixed a geometry that most people have that make their splitting edges part of their flute. Okay. Uh, Ed, Edward, can you uh, put that up again and unshare your screen so we can see that in a little more detail? Sure. Okay. Um, they can see you now. Okay. Um, oh, that's great. So it slides back and forth. In fact, it it comes out. There's the split wow. edge, and it goes in in this channel on the flute. Um, and and so the splitting edge can be done very accurately because it's in your hand. You can see all sides. In fact, I use wider gauges and. Um, granite flats and stuff like that to make this this thing perfect before it's in the flute and 
then I put it in the flute and I can move it back and forth um, to vary the, the tuning as well as the tone. Um, I've been doing that for about, I don't know, 15 years. Um, this oh, this number kind of arrangement. Um, you'll also notice that the bird flips around. Uh -huh. um, so I can I can put my um, chimney side or my uh, slant side over the uh, the TSH at will, depending on if I I want a a dead clean tone, which the the slant side gives me compared to. A little more volume, a little more resonance, uh, maybe a little more wind resistance, then I'll turn the uh, chimney around. And when I typically set these up for a customer, um, very few customers have good breath control and the chimney side seems to be a little more uh, helpful for them. Okay, so have I answered those questions? Very well, thank you. Okay. Big help. So back to nodal interference. Okay, so nodal interference, um, I, I will measure the length of the flute and um, so let's bring up my spreadsheet and I haven't used it in a while. So I, I've worked out the, the FIPPLE factor. I can throw it into the program and and get my first try layout for the holes essentially it's going to tell me what the final bore length is um and that's all i really want to want to know and it's going and we know what the frequency is um and the temperature and there's there was a question on temperature I, i'll get into that um i know the bore length i know the bore diameter um i can either put no holes or 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 fill out his spreadsheet uh, on there. And then I push the button and it will give me the acoustic length, six hole acoustic length. Basically, I just look at this ratio right here. That's the number that I plug in to um, this, this value here, the lowest amount. Okay, can you see that? No. Oh, I didn't share the screen again, did I? Sorry. <laughs> Let me, I'll go through that again. Okay, now we've got a screen again, right? Yes. Oh, yep. Okay, so this is Mike's Prairie spreadsheet. Um, I'll, I'll enter the, <clears throat> the key um, temperature. I'll, I'll always leave at 72 degrees for WI Designer. The bore length that I've measured um, from that, that try uh, optimization and the bore diameter. Don't really care about this number here. It, it will calculate that this ratio right down here. That's the one that I plug in over here for the minimum um r ratio for the splitting edge to the um sixth hole the top hole um i find <clears throat> for for me that i can that sometimes gives me a slight reduction in the playability of those top two notes and so all if it says 25% like like or if this said 29 and I never go, end up with numbers that high, 29%, I may make it 31% and put that in there. That just couple of percent is enough to, to give me enough leeway um, that I don't get any nodal interference. Now, your, your results may vary from that, but that's what I, what I do. And yeah, I throw down a whole batch of flutes because I got carried away before I entered these <laughs> uh -huh. things uh, in because I don't want a weak um, 
top of the octave on the notes, that that C or the um, B flat on a C flute. It's not tolerable for me. They they get trashed. So yeah, I take that nodal interference value very seriously. So. Oh. Um, uh, perhaps I'm not grasping something. So you design your flute, get your fitful factor. Um, at this point, you have an undrilled flute at this point. Right. Uh, you know your length. You're then plugging that into Mike Prairie's calculation. No, nope. one more step. I, What's that? I, I take the fitful factor. Uh-huh. Plug it into this unmade flute so far. Uh -huh. With some holes that don't mean anything, with a length that was the length of the, or maybe that doesn't have any holes in it, but with a length that was whatever I measured, which is going to be flat. It's a little bit longer than, than right. the final flute. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. I, I calculate my hole layout for it. Then I know the exact length of that flute that's going to be made when I... Mm -hmm. That's the number that I plug into my Prairie spreadsheet. And then you, and then you, come back and you back. take you take the uh, uh, the ratio that comes out of his, and you plug that into the constraints um, into, as the min, as the lower bound. You don't care if it's it's further away from the splitting edge. You just care if it's it's closer. So that's the minimum value. And and that tends to vary from whatever uh, ratio is set within the program itself, because um, uh, what I've done is is I've, I've I've never actually put the numbers back in, but I have looked at what the uh, Mike's program generates, and it's usually something larger than what my minimum constraint is anyway. So so, so uh, let, let's take let's suppose this were the case right here. Um, but it was 0.293. And like mm -hmm. I say, I pop that up a little little bit, give myself a little bit of headroom. So I would put, um, say, 0.31 in that field. And then I would use that as the constraints. So, uh -huh. for, so, so then you're readjusting your tuning holes all over again. Yeah, but I haven't drilled it. Yes. Right, right. Right. So, so, right. so when, starting from scratch, when I go to say I'm going to, to design a flute, um, I come up with the scale that I'm going to use and the fingering pattern. So I get a tuning file I, or create a tuning file. And we'll get, get to your questions on diatonic flute by creating such a tuning file. Um, and know the key. I'll, I'll plug in historic values, so I'll pull just any old flute up that's that's close to what I'm going to make, and I save all of my mm -hmm. designs. Um, and a hint: if you if you save all your designs, don't save it in the default directory that you just, <laughs> that you install the program. And save it in another one because you'll install a new version of the program, and you don't mm -hmm. have to keep moving things around. Um, right. So yeah. They, the installation directories for the program stay virgin um, in my hands, and I have a separate set of directories that have all my stuff. So I bring up a flute that's close. I don't much care. Um, get the FIPL factor right, based upon historical analysis for me, because it's important, and run a design based upon whatever constraints um, I'm using. So for me, it wouldn't be a grouped whole position in size. That's not the type of flute that I typically make. I typically make a single taper with um, a hemispherical head and no hole grouping. That's that's how I lay out holes. But you might so and you guys know the difference between a hemi head and a um, and a square head, right? Yep. Yeah, speaking of that, I recently started gun drilling. Yes. What would I use for you, would, you you then stick a flat headed plug in there and and so okay. that would be just like this one here. So if I pull up the picture of it by clicking draw a sketch 
of the instrument. Um, there's the flat head up at the um, at the top of the flute, and it's All right. in in this case it's right at the back of the um, of the TSH. You could move it further back if you wanted. Um, I don't recommend it. I I recommend you you put the top of the bore as close to the back of the TSH as you can get it. And I, we can go through some some calculations on why that's really the right thing to do. But um, okay. that, that's what it would look like for you. I I use a router table, and so all of my flutes have a hemispherical head. And in order to get them as close as possible to that um, back of the TSH without having to uh, do a lot of chiseling, I'll make the bottom, the top of the flute, an eighth of an inch higher than the TSH. So for me, my measurements are all from the top of the TSH. And you can tell that because the splitting edge position and the TSH length are the same. I don't know where you guys measure from. You can measure from anywhere you want. The program doesn't care. Um, but uh, I like to measure from the back of the TSH because I have a movable splitting edge. <laughs> like a move, moving target. Um, so now, now I, I notice in, in some of the uh, uh, tutorials you had mentioned from the splitting edge. Is that just a... a no, the, uh, the splitting it, edge is actually the origin of the sound mechanism. So wherever I decide my zero point is, the program uh -huh. internally will convert it to from the splitting edge. So if I'm talking about FIPPLE factor, for example, it's from the splitting edge. Um, when I'm looking at, at uh, hole placements, um, should I be measuring from the north end of the true sound hole or the south end? Whatever you want. Okay. You just have to be consistent. So, for example, for this layout, and, and we're looking at the splitting edge position, this um, uh, whole sound mechanism set of parameters, um, if my and I'll bring up the picture too, so that I can have something to point to. And they, my pictures come up in a different screen. That's why you see the lag. Mm -hmm. I have to drag them across. So the splitting edge position on mine, on this flute here is 0.18 inches. So it's, it's off of zero and the length is 0.18 inches. Now, if you wanted to measure from the splitting edge instead, if that's your preference, and, and when I had a fixed splitting edge, I often measured from the, the splitting edge as well. Let's get rid of that, let's change it. So my TSH length there is 0.18. Let's make its position zero. Okay, easy. And now the position of the top of the bore um, is not going to be at the splitting edge. It's going to be upstream, which is a minus number. And so it's minus 0.18. Okay, and let's see what happens then. Abracadabra, it's the same exact flute, except the zero now is at the splitting edge, not at the top of the TSH. I see. Mm -hmm. So just make a decision on which way you're going to go. Um, I, I go from the, the top of the TSH because I won't even have the splitting edge in the flute when I'm laying out holes. Uh-huh. Okay. Is there is there a rule of thumb that you use on a hemi head as to how far back it goes from the uh, back of the TSH? Okay, let's 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 make this into a hemi head flute. So I'm gonna actually let's make it easy. I'm gonna just kill that starter flute and reopen it, so I don't have to change the numbers back. Okay, now we're back to where we were. Let's make it a hemi head. 
And I'm, like I said, I put it up an eighth of an inch above. And let me show you why. So it's minus 0.125, an eighth of an inch above my zero, which is the top of the TSH. And now I'm going to create a hemi head. Okay. Now I have a hemispherical head on the flute. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, so if you look for a half inch um, wide TSH, the back of the bore just touches the TSH. That means I don't have to chisel a lot of wood out so that the TSH is fully exposed. So I arbitrarily chose that to try to get it as close as possible to the TSH without a lot of work on my part to, to have to chisel out the, the rectangular hole there. Yeah. So um, the drawing shows that it's, uh, it's not uh, half a uh, router bit, it's, it's, it's more flattened. Is that just because of the picture that shows up there or? Yeah, it's, it's uh, so, so uh, let's make the circles round. Now it looks like a router bit. I just expanded the the horizontal section, uh, the vertical section on it. You can you can, re you can resize the picture. So when you put a minus eighth inch there, it's going from the back of the TSH to the furthest point right on the on the bore. Yeah. So what happens when you're using a large bore flute? Try that. Is it still going to be proportional? I I still always use an eighth of an inch. It doesn't matter much. Further, I make a bigger TSH than these example files are. These TSHs are are kind of the standard that people use, which is a half the width of the bore. I make mine almost two thirds of the width of the bore. I make big TSHs. Uh, you can, you can, when I show this, let me unshare the screen and I'll show you again. Um, look how wide my TSH is compared to the bore. They're very wide. <laughs> they're not, not small. Even with my smaller flutes, um, they're quite wide. Yes, right. Um, I do that because it gives me a little bit more volume. You might find as um, that your construction technique doesn't support them getting that wide. It's just an experimental thing that you have to have to play with. Right. Okay. Um, let me first check and see if anybody else has tried to get in. Um, nope. It's just us. So let's go back to sharing. So have I answered that question? Whatever it was. <laughs> or did I even get into it? Um, oh, so, so then I, I just lay out that flute. Um, but yes, I almost always, well, I always have a, a hemispherical head to my flutes. And I get them close. And if we have time or, or interest, I can show you why I get them close. And it, it, the TSH. It, it does sound to, to bring this back around to the question I, I think that was asked on the rule of thumb here is essentially what you're trying to do with the placement of the true sound hole on a hemispherical head is to create an arc where the two corners of your sound hole are actually touching the back of the um, uh, uh, of the arc um, of your board. Correct. Just because we got that a little bit echo there. Yes. Yeah. It, it just uh, means I don't have to chisel out um, that section of the of the bore. Um, it's it's a construction convenience. 
but I do try to get to the top of the bore as close to the sound hole as I can get because that is critical to the tuning of the second octave. So let's say, for example, if you didn't have it chiseled out exactly. It probably wouldn't that, matter at all. For example, the, the back of the true sound hole is further away from the, the back of the radius of the bore than you would like it. Yep. That's going to affect the second octave notes more. It does. Um, so I can I can demonstrate that. It'll take me probably 10 minutes to demonstrate that. Or I can go into um, creating tuning files. But which would you like me to do? I can do it. Take your word for it. What's that? I would take your word for it. So essentially, if I run, and, and it, it's common practice for, well, uh, let me kill that again and bring it up. It's fairly common practice that people will set the top of that radius, the top of the bore, um, at half the router, at half the bore diameter. So we would set it at um, minus 0.5. And that's a lot of people make flutes like that, right? Mm -hmm. You'll find that it's almost impossible to get um, just the a couple of the second octave notes in tune doing that. It'll just absolutely wipe you out trying to do that. Right. And I can do the, I, the program will, will show you why it's really not possible. It's so, say for example, you're crafting a flute and you have that going on. Is there a way that the program can um, compensate for that? It, it tries to. It does, an, it does an optimization. It does as well as it can. Um, well, hell, let's just do it. Let's take. Let's look, look at all options. Let's, let's do it sequentially. Um, bring up the flute again with the top of the board, even with the um, the top of the sound, because that's as good as you can get. And let's look at the tuning of this flute. And you'll notice that I'm going to get rid of Mike's spreadsheet. You'll notice that the tuning on this baby is all of the pentatonic minor notes are in tune because that's what it was optimized for, and all the other ones are out of tune because there was no optimization for it. I make a chromatically tuned flute. Um, mm -hmm. Every one of those notes on one of my flutes are in tune within five cents um, because that's just the kind of flute that I want to play and that's the kind of flute that my customers want to play. Um, well, let's optimize this flute for a uh, chromatically tuned flute. So let's a good whole, whole size and, and, and taper, um, which is what this optimized, what this, and let's bring it back to 0.25. Um, let's optimize this flute. Now it's going to optimize it. So digressing a little bit, if I were to take this tuning file, and wanted to optimize that flute and just for the pentatonic minor notes. Um, 
I would set all of the weights on the notes that weren't pentatonic minor to zero. And I could go through this, this baby very quickly and just set them to zero. Oops, that's a little. And so forth. And, and um, that would be a zero and, and do the optimization. So we're not going to do that. We're going to now use all the notes. So rather than. So there it is again with a weighting of one for all of the values. And we've got starter flute, that tuning, no multi start optimization, group toll size and position. And we saw what that looked like. We're just going to group the top three holes and the bottom three holes. Um, we're going to allow an inch and a quarter between holes in each one of the groups, and we're going to let it vary by a lot in hole size. And we hit the optimize, optimize button. And it's done. So I look at this final error value. If it's zero, that means the flute was going to be in perfect tune. If um, it's something like this, we know, we know it's not. So let's see how well it, it is in tune. And each note has an average deviation out of tune of eight cents. And some of them are fairly ugly. Um, but some of them aren't too bad. Let's, let's simplify the problem a little bit. And because we're talking about second octave notes getting in tune and, and that. So let's get rid of that one. Let's start with this and let's just make it a pentatonic minor, but going into the second octave. In fact, we'll make it really easy. We'll just go into the second octave with the minor third. So I'm going to zero out all the notes that I wouldn't typically have. Then that one I can do. Okay. So you can see I have just, well, let's, let's use it to, to do the tuning file. And so you can see what notes I've included. I've included the pentatonic minor notes. And I've just included the second octave minor third. An octave above that baby. And you can see it's out by a lot. Mm -hmm. So now let's do the optimization. Pretty close to a perfect G. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, and the reason why I use this fingering is because on almost any flute that I make and any flute that I've picked up, that voices very well. Um, if you lift the second note, up, second hole up, it rarely voices well on, on most any flute. Some do, but, but rarely. So let's just do the optimization. Okay, we got a perfect flute on that one. As far as tuning. Oh, we probably have to have a couple of more notes in there to um, constrain it. Well, let's let's find out if I'm right. So let's make this a hemispherical head that's um, minus five point five uh, inches. Okay, now we have a hemispherical fluke, and we're going to start with that one, and let's do the optimization on it. Didn't have to change anything else. 
Aha! Notice the final error there now is significant. And let's see what the tuning is. So just by creating that hemispherical head, let's show that I haven't cheated on you. Um, a hemispherical head that was a half inch above the TSH, I could not get the simple, the six simple notes in the pentatonic minor and that second octave note to give me a reasonable flute. On uh, average, I have half tense, which is acceptable to me. Anyway. Um, and that's the best you can get. It's um, having equal space, two groups of, of equal spaced notes. And mm -hmm. it's a fairly ugly flute, in fact. So right. now let's... Um, Firewood. <laughs> Let's go back and take this flute and let's do what I typically do. Uh, let's just start from the starter flute and do a point one, two, five above. Create a hemis hemispherical head there and use that flute as the start and do an optimization. And now we have a zero error again. So just by moving that, um, and we'll show you the flute just by moving the top of the bore closer to the TSH, I now have a perfectly tuned flute with that second octave note. Mm -hmm. That's why I always keep the top of my bore as close as possible to the TSH for exactly that reason. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I think that a flute that won't play that note in tune and this is my personal opinion, is a throwaway. Uh, I use that note all the time. And, and I, I have the, um, the octaves um, major second also in tune, and also the minor second in tune, because I use those notes all the time. Um, anything higher, I can't get all my flutes to play reliably, um, so I don't worry about it. I, I tend to make a very big bore flute, not a small bore flute. I just like the tone quality of it. So did I answer that yeah. question in gory detail? <laughs> I appreciate it. Oh, of course, that always invites more questions. Sure. Um, I know that with concert flutes, uh, in order to work with the tuning, where, where they have you know quite a bit of headroom above the embouchure, that um, there are these rather pricey additions uh, that you can get installed in the flute where they actually add a wedge. A uh, taro wedge, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, I'm wondering, just looking at you know, our, our, our simple wooden solution to that, have you ever looked at backing the sound hole actually out of the bore of the flute and actually cutting a channel for the sound hole and, and essentially simul simulating uh, a wedge there. I, I've actually made a wedge for it. A um, uh -huh. couple of different ways. You can cut a piece of wood that's that's shaped to drop right in, and then you can shape it to to be differently. Or um, when I was, I have a cat in the background that wants my attention. <laughs> that uh, you can pour some some epoxy in it and hold the flute at an angle until the epoxy sets and make. A huh. And I found that any wedge that I created at the top of the bore with um, enough profile to affect the tuning adversely affected the tone quality. Really interesting. So it was a it was no brainer. You just don't do that. Mm -hmm. These flutes, 
I, Thanks. You just saved me a lot of firewood. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a distinct difference between this and a transverse flute. One is the the aspect ratio, the bore diameter to length, mm -hmm. which is very different. And second is the the dynamics of the airflow. You put a, you blow a lot harder in a transverse flute than you blow in one of these flutes. Uh, it's the the equations are essentially set up for no airflow in, in in the flute body. It's just a standing wave, um, so it it does behave a lot differently. And anything that you do to change that behavior is going to affect affect the tone. And, and maybe that's okay. So one of the the acceptable effects of blowing harder and smaller bore is called a whistle, you make an Irish whistle. And you can play multiple octaves with an Irish whistle. Um, your, your blood pressure goes up as you get into the third octave because you have to blow so hard. And <laughs> WI Designer will help you. Um, it has a whistle study model as well for making them, where the, um, the air jet model is much more sophisticated than the Native American flute which has a fairly steady um, change in airflow as you go with the flute, whereas you clearly don't have that in an Irish whistle. Um, and so you have to calibrate airflow in an Irish whistle too, not just a fipple factor, but how much harder you're gonna blow as you go up the scale in it. And, and it accommodates that. So if you, if you wanna make that kind of flute, um, you use the whistle study model uh, with that level of sophistication. Um, and that, a whistle may, may in fact work okay with um, a Fajardo wedge or something like that. It has more airflow, it has a smaller diameter. Okay, did I answer that question? Yes. Okay. Yes. So let's go on to making um, your own tuning files. Has anybody, everybody made their own tuning file, files? If you've made a number of different flutes, and different keys, I don't supply all of the, the different keys and tuning files. So I'm sure you've all done that, correct? Yes, yes. I used your um, video tutorial, took notes and followed along and made multiple keys that I'll be using with my flutes. So if, if you're using, uh, so you, you can a diatonic, I'm going to get organic for a, for a minute, and, and I apologize, but diatonic doesn't mean it, it's not synonymous with the major scale. Diatonic just means the seven notes in a scale. Um, mm -hmm. The seven notes in a minor scale are also diatonic notes. So what you really are talking about, and, and you, can, you can look it up, Wikipedia has a, a really good talk about this. But what you're, you're talking about is, is creating a tuning for a flute that uh, is a major scale with starting with all holes down. Is, is that what you're requesting? Correct. Okay. Um, you certainly can modify uh, the normal tuning file that, that is, is basically set up for, for a minor scale, or you can create one from scratch. And I find it's easy enough to create from scratch that lets you do that. So I'm going to bring up the tuning wizard. It is. I tried to put this together in such a way that a tuning file was not necessarily the end product. It's really made up of a bunch of scale symbols that you use to, to describe your scale. It could be do, re, mi. It could be um, Japanese symbols for a shakuhachi, um, or it could be Hemholtz or traditional. Um, so you can save those 
Attempt. Attempt. Now you're probably most of you doing um, equal temperament, mm -hmm. flutes, and that's mostly what I do. Occasionally, I'll do a just intonation flute, um, but but only rarely. So that's called temperament. It essentially tells you the spacing, the intervals, um, as ratios between adjacent notes. Um, and so you can save temperaments as a separate thing and combine them together with a scale with intervals. Um, then you can set a base frequency for your scale. You can set fingering patterns, um, which is an independent entity. And finally, you combine them all into a, a, a tuning, uh, which is the program. Sense. So let's go through that. Um, typically, Let do it. I, I I choose scientific symbols with sharps only. If you sh if you do um, scientific symbols, you'll have duplicate entries for any note with an accidental. So you have a C sharp and a D flat, which is the same note, and so it just gets mm -hmm. in the way. Um, so instead, let's let's do it with one or the other. And since Nakai Tab has four four sharps. You tend to use sharps, but okay. So now we just have um, the sharp symbols. Um, I don't tend to save different sets. If I were making something from scratch, I would save sets. So give me a diatonic flute that you want to make, a major scale flute that you want to make. What key? Uh, let's make it in an F. An F. Uh, a middle F, a uh, Monto flute? Yes, middle F. Okay. So I'm going to choose the note above it. I just clicked it. And now I scroll to the top of that list. I'm going to hold my shift key and click that. So I've selected everything in between and delete the selected. So now I've, the top note is an F, F4. So a lot of the spreadsheet um, quick keys that you've used work, work in um, WI Designer. Um, how many octaves are you going to make it? Two. Two full octaves. You're brave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could get a flute to, to play in that. So F4, 5, and 6. I can't. We'll, we'll just try to see what happens. Sure. I, the program will just tell you what it can do. So I clicked on F6 sharp and the top that and deleted selection. So now we have just the symbols, chromatic, and you're going to make a chromatic flute or are you going to make a, um, well, let's leave it here. So here's my recommendation. Always leave a chromatic at this stage because okay. it lines up with your temperaments um, easily as you go on. We can delete row at any point. Okay, so now we have a two octave flute going from F4 to F6. Um, you said you do um, equal temperament? Right. Okay, so let's do that. Um, and it's a two octave flute, so one octave is a factor of two, and two octaves is a factor of four. So, okay, so now we have two octaves of equal temperament. And if I, if I start going too fast, slow me down. So now we go where we combine them. And I'm going to load the symbols from the symbol page and load the intervals from the template. If we had stored those in the pack pages, we could load them from the XML files. So if you have any, any desire to reuse these things, um, that's what you would do. So now I'm gonna click on the top of the F4. Are you guys using PCs or Macs? PC. Okay, so I'm gonna click the, the top symbol here and 
do a control A or a command A, I would imagine, on a Mac. So I've selected the whole table and I'm just going to drag it across. Okay. So you've all done that, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Do the same thing on this side of the table. Control A, drag it across. And if life is good, it should line up at the bottom, and it does. Life is good. <laughs> so now we have a scale, but the notes are called F4, F, F sharp 4, and so forth, with intervals based upon the F4 with, with this ratio of, of note frequency. <laughs> And we, we could clean up and change things and, and edit these cells and do whatever we wanted um, at this point in time. Um, I don't store, it's not, this isn't a persistent um, thing, scales with intervals, because it's so easy to make. So now we, we want to set our reference note for those. So I'm going to load the scales and intervals. And I'm going to set a reference note, which is a pitch for one of the notes in this scale. So this, this table is, this drop down is just populated with every single note in um, this list. Typically, you're going to do an A440, so it's nice to have an A in there. <laughs> and um, do you do anything differently when the A4 does not show up when you're? Using different tunings. That's why I that's why I will do chromatic, so that the A4 shows up, and then I can delete it out later. Okay. If not, you'll have to do the calculations offline. All right. Okay. Um. So typically, people do four four two four three two or one. Two. Somebody turn their microphone off. Yeah, if you're doing some sanding there. <laughs> um, if you're, <clears throat> I had one customer that, <clears throat> that wanted 432 flutes. And I made them uh, like a dozen flutes in, in what was called Verity tuning. Um, I, mm -hmm. I can hear the difference. I, it doesn't, doesn't move me any differently. Um, I like something I can play along with my piano and other instruments, so I 440. So I create that. And so now it's a scale with frequencies. If I want to reuse that baby, and I can delete some of the, some of the notes that I don't want to use at this point, um, I can give it a name and a description, and then I can save it. Until I give it a name and a description, I can't save it. We're not going to save it now. Now we, we can load a finger pattern, or we can make a new fingering pattern <clears throat> for reuse. I'm not going to do either of them now because I'm not going to reuse it. I'm going to do it in the next step here. OK, how many holes do you want in this flute? Six. Okay, some people do six hole uh, major tunings and some do seven. Um, let's do six. Okay, so we've created one hole there with, with one diagram. Same game that we had before. Click the top one, control A, drag it across. And the whole thing's populated. Okay, now you get to define what those those tunings are. Well, F four is going to be all holes closed, right? Right. F sharp is probably a half hold note, right? Mm hmm. And WI designer doesn't know how to calculate half holes. If you wanted it to do a half hole, you could create another hole here and, and it would give a different diameter. Let's just get rid of that. So we're not going to do an F, F sharp. A G is, this is the important one for a major 
flute is one open hole, right? Correct. Um, the minor, um, are the semitone above that, are you going to tune for that? And what's your fingering pattern? So you have choices. Um, this is as good as you're going to get right now, right? Mm hmm And for your A4, there you go, right? So first choice point here. You just oh, lost all your covered holes. A4 sharp is... Oh, you move it down. Okay. Okay, it's going to be maybe like that, or maybe like that, covering both. You you can determine that later on when you're actually using it to see which one gives you your better tuning. But let's just do the simple one. Okay. Okay. Um, B four is likely going to be that correct. Mm -hmm. Now you get a C where you're only going a semitone, but you're going to open up a full note. There's there's one of the challenging notes with a major major scale. A um, I'm going to go here probably. So so there's it, how you're. Um, your notes that are not in the diatonic scale. So now it's a diatonic that I'm using, at, but are in the chromatic. Um, you're going to have choices on on what your fingering patterns are. You can you can change those on the fly when you try to make a flute. Okay, a D is there. D sharp. Let's who knows. Let's let's do that. An E <clears throat> is going to be all open, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how are you going to play the F on this, on this flute? This is the octave. Are you going to yep, overblow sure. it, or are you going to crack the hole, or are you going to play it um, like that? I'd say probably like that, top hole uncovered. Totally uncovered. Okay. And I think most people play it as an overblow. They may crack it a little bit. And if right. you were to do that, you would put this in. So you're going to look for the harmonic of, of all holes closed. Okay. Um, but let's, let's do that. I'm easy. Like so I the program is smart enough to, to look at the second harmonic? automatically yep as you do this cool yes. yeah it, it looks within all the residences within i believe it's a setting hardwired setting of an octave and a half and finds the closest one to, to figure is one of the questions i had also so we'll we'll see if that works out okay um, second octave above that, how are you going to, to do those? Oh, I should stop at one octave. Okay, so let's get rid of all of those so we don't have to deal with it. Actually, let's, let's leave them in in case we want to do them later. Okay, so now this does not translate back into... Um, actually, let me kick out for a second. We have somebody else that's waiting to come in. Let me... Bring him in. Hey, Rick. Okay. So now let's get back into my sharing. Okay. So we have to save this. It's not going to translate directly across into the other interface. So I'm going to give it a name. Um, And who, who cares? I have a pen in 
my lap. That's why I can't type. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we're going to save. And let's just do what I said I wasn't going to do, but let's just save it into, oh, that's in four. Let's save it into five. And that's NAF, and that's a tuning. And we can call it whatever we want. Okay, so now it's done. Let's clear out this interface. Um, and close all those files, or we can just do something sneaky. Close out the program. And I will bring it up. There it is again. And it remembers some things. Let's. How big a, a board diameter did you want to make this, this F flute? Uh, seven eight. Okay, so let's see what we have for done seven eighths. There's one right there. So de novo, um, we don't let you make a, a file. It, it's too big a burden, but just use something that's close. Okay, and now let's also open up your tuning file. And where did it go? You put it in version 2.5. Ah. Good call. And here it is. Life is good. And there it is. Um, how are you going to design? Right? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. There was background noise. You use a gun drill, so you have have yeah. a flat end. Right. Okay. It has a slight radius to it on a gun drill, and it I don't know if you've ever seen a gun drill hole. There, in the middle of the board, has a slight cone shape coming out of it toward. Yeah, I've seen them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and you can model that. Um, you you can put some estimate of what that is in here. Um, as long as you don't use a hemi head optimizer, it won't change the top of the flute. It'll only change the bottom of the flute. Okay. You, you can put whatever you you guess as close, and it will be probably very close. Um, let's let's just do this square. Um, let's bring up that tuning file and get rid of those notes that we don't care about. We're just going to give them a weight of zero. And Rick, if you just came in, we're just doing a diatonic, a, a major scale flute in the key of F. Okay, so they're all zeroed out. Um, we have six holes on this flute. We could add different holes or take out holes at, on the fly at this point in time. Um, just for jollies, let's see what its tuning is before we do anything. And of course, it's way off. <laughs> um, Piece of firewood. Yeah, let's see how well we, we do. Now, are you going to group the holes or not? Uh, no. 
Okay, so no whole grouping, so it's just whole size and position here. Let's open up a constraint. I just want to see what it will do without grouping the holes. Okay, and that's what I always start with too. Then I'll do a whole grouping and you probably didn't notice when I held up my flutes, I angle some of the holes. So on the inside of the flute where they don't matter, um, they're not equal spacing. But on the outside of the flute where you see them, they look like they're equal spacing. So mm. I, I, I angle quite a number of holes. So how far can your, your people, um, how, can, how far can you stretch your fingers? Let's say inch and a quarter. Okay. In a quarter, and you're going to play the top three holes with one hand and the bottom three holes with your other hand. Yes. Okay. So that's I asked that because of the the whole space in between hole three and four. That's the big one. Um, mm -hmm. We happy with everything else here? Okay. Let's do an optimization on this baby and see if we get anything that that is looks reasonable. It's fighting. <laughs> it's not even close to, to being close. Okay. Um, it didn't do very well at all. No, not at all. And um, major scale flutes are a challenge, but the biggest challenge is some of the chromatic notes. So let's look at it. Um, wow. So, so again, the major scale notes are going to have no sharps or flats except for the B flat or the C sharp. Um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, we can we can select them. So that we can see them easier. So is there anything you can do with um, whole size and grouping to make that better? So let's play with it a little bit. Now, if I can interject, one of the things that I've played around with that seems to be useful is um, creating a grouping of uh, holes with zero distance, as you would do with the um, with the uh, direction holes, and use that for modeling half holes. So you can do that. Um, I figure that if I can do a half hole. Um, so that the, the note here that I'm looking at um, is flat so I can open up the, the lowest hole a little bit, I'll just take that out of the optimization and not even bother because I know I can half hole it to get it into tune. Um, and, and it's a lot less complicated than putting the extra hole, but you're right, you can, you can create another hole. Um, in there in exactly the same position. So we can see that what's killing us here is the octave note. The second octave note. Oh, I didn't zero that one out. That's why. Let's see what I missed. Yep, I did. My bad. So let's delete that. Let's delete that guy. And let's do it again. You're fine, Flash. <laughs> My cat's. Okay. That's a little better instead of 12,000 for our uh, some deviation, we're down to 2,800. Let's see how bad that is. Okay, average deviation of 15. F, G, A. A flat, C, D, E, and F. Okay. 
So in the notes that we don't want, not much is driving us. I'm looking at the chromatic scale here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if we can make just the diatonic flute, having just the seven notes, and then we'll add the um, chromatic notes uh, to see what we can get back in. Does that sound like a plan? Mm -hmm. But that's the kind of thing that you have to do. And, and then we can, we can even vary the weightings and we can play with the fingering. So I'm going to... Yeah, that's what I thought I would do when I was looking at the program, was just vary the weightings to, to create a diatonic scale. Ah, uh, um, so... And you'll notice that the F5 is 30 cents off. That was my worry. Just for fun, let's make it an overblow note instead. Or that you could crack this hole a little bit, which will have almost the same tuning as the overblow. Mm -hmm. um, and let's run it again. So let's start with the starter again. It doesn't matter really. We should get closer. It's still fighting hard. Okay, we probably have a close to respectable flute there. Okay, just the two octaves are off. And the rest are, are, are pretty much dead on. So now here's one of the uses that I do with the weightings, not to reduce notes, but to get notes in better tune. I want to spread out the deviation from these two notes to the rest of the flute. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the scale. And notice how, how changing your fingering pattern um, helped us a whole lot. Yeah, it did. Um, you might find that um, changing your headspace, the amount of bore above the flute for a major scale flute, um, might help a little bit. Changing your bore diameter might help a little bit uh, because you're looking at an overblow here, really. Um, so let's go back to here. And I really like the fundamental and its octave to be in two or close. Right. So instead yeah. of a, a weight of one, I'm going to give it a weight of 10. And the same with the octave. And we won't cheat. We'll start with the, the top and do it again so now it will never give you a smaller deviation total but it'll spread it out a little better um, and let's see how much it spread it out oh it didn't spread it out at all it didn't do any better. I mean, it'll always have uh, an average deviation greater um, once we start doing the weightings, but it didn't give us any better. It, the optimizer said, I can't do any better than that, those two notes with, with that whole layout. Um, that this note is independent of all the other holes. Um, and this note, which is the same note, is independent of all the other holes too, right? It's it's all holes closed. 
That's I've never I haven't seen that before. Yeah, it says that it just doesn't help. How big a number can we put in that waiting? Um, I don't think it cares. It's an integer in, in <laughs> Java, which is um, 32 bit. It'd be a really big number. Uh -huh. Okay, let's try it again. Or it could be a bug in the program. Don't tell anybody. Because all, <laughs> the only thing that it can do to optimize all those um, is to change the bore length, those two notes. That's all it can do. Wow, that was even worse. It was very much worse. So let's go back to um, our constraints. I'm going to get rid of two of those guys. Oh, we're, we're, we're thrashing here. We're having a 16 inch bore length. And now I'm going to go to the constraints. And it's trying to look for solutions anywhere between 7 and a half and 27 and a half. And that's good. Let's do um, from 14 to 19 inches. That's the only range it's going to look at for bore length. See if that makes a difference. And it didn't make any difference. So that 10,000 um, is not a good number for the... Um, this. I don't think I've ever tried 10,000. <laughs> Actually, I know I have never tried 10,000. I think the highest I've ever gone is maybe 10. Ah, so there, there was a hundred on that one. And it helped. Now it's spread the, um, the deviations around. Um, but we have two bad, bad notes. And so you can, you can do those kind of, kind of playing. Um, mm -hmm. So if we were to calculate in grouped whole position and size, it would actually be worse, wouldn't it? Yes, it should always be worse or as good. Um, um, we can do that pretty quickly. Let's get rid of all of these guys. Now, I've started playing around with uh, monkeying with the results manually where uh, for example, I might zero out a couple of notes that are problematic and then um, uh, run my numbers and then go into the results and uh, maybe change the whole diameters or slightly tweak their placement a little bit um, and then regenerate the tuning file uh, without actually re-optimizing just based on my manual numbers. And it does produce a different result, but I don't know if it's an accurate result. Yes, it's uh, exactly result. accurate. It, I do that. Okay, so time. so that's going to give me good 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 results if I want to just say, okay, well, I, I know this is going to be off. Let's see how bad. Maybe I'll change the thickness a little bit and simulate an undercut. Sure. That's that's what I do when I'm, I'm doing my mm -hmm. angle cuts and stuff. I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's also why I... Um, have this whole size only optimizer here so that I can move the holes around manually and and see what it does to the whole size. Um, so yes, I do that as well. Uh, can, can you address the uh, um, 
differences between the multi-start optimization and the very bore length because I'm confused because I have found that my bore length sometimes changes when I'm on no, no multi-start optimization. So, so what is it not doing? Okay, so the problem we're trying to address is that if you think of the solution space um, as a topo map, where the tuning errors are, um, are the heights of the peaks and valleys, and the dimensions of, of the, the horizontal dimensions are any of the parameters we're varying. So it's, it's a multi-dimensional topo map. Uh, turns out that for the kind of flutes that we make with the variables that we have, it's a very complex surface. And it's easy for the program to get stuck in um, a valley that's not the lowest valley. It's trying to find the lowest place. Okay. And um, so if you just give it one shot at a start position, so, so again, think of this topo map um, simply, that it's going to start from a position on that topo map, and it's kind of find a path by slowly changing the variables, which is what it does, um, and find a path to the lowest point in that topo map, it can get stuck in not the low, at the, it can get stuck at the lowest, that's not the lowest point in the whole map. Um, so that's where I created the multi-start optimization where there's multiple starts um, to that map. Originally, I had, um, instead of very bore length, it, it varied all of the parameters. And it made slices of each one of the parameters within the range that you set within the constraints, because each one of these rows is a variable for that optimization. It's a, it's a multivariate analysis in a big way. And it turned out that I wasn't sampling the space very well, and it didn't make much of a difference. That um, the only one, only variable that really <clears throat> always signed the lowest point of paper properly was the bore length. And so that, those are the slices that it's making when it says, let's try to, to look at different start points in that top of that. It's slicing, if I, if I do 10, um, 10 starts, here's the option menu, and um, number of starts in the optimization. If I do 10 starts, it's going to slice this range, and that's why I made that range smaller, um, into 10 spots feed those as a flute as the starting point to each to the optimization for each one of those 10 runs and then find the best run at, out of those 10 runs. Um, I almost always use multi-start optimization when I'm doing tapered bores because it's an enormous um, solution space. I virtually never use multi-start optimization when I'm doing these simple problems, um, because there's no need. But if you want to find out if there is a need, just crank up the number of optimizations. Uh, let's just do three. <laughs> and collect, do very bore length. So this is going to take a little longer. Same optimization that we just ran. And look at this log file that's being created down in the console window. And it's going to take a little longer. The first thing multi-start does is it ignores the original flute. 
and tries to find the best global start optimization. So let's let's tear this off. I don't know if you guys knew that you could tear these things off and move them around, <laughs> resize them. Okay, so you could leave it off and you can drop it back in if you want. Um, so it first does a different algorithm for finding the optimization. That's its global optimizer. That's going to be its start point. Uh, and then it runs the optimizer. And the only thing that you need to look at, this is mostly debugging stuff. It's actually what the start values are for all of those parameters. Um, for start one, um, it's tuning error. The same tuning error we were looking at before is 17,000. The second one is 17,000. The third one is 17,000. So with those three different start points across the whole range of board um, lines that we use, exactly the same, same answer. There was no need to do the multi-start. It found the same one, even if it was starting in very different spots in the um, parameter space. So that's the way to, to tell if you need to do multi-start. Um, sometimes if I am not that confident that my starting flute is going to get me close with just a single pass optimization, I will go back up here, set the number of starts to one, and choose multi-start very boringly. It will then use the start flute for the optimization based upon that global optimization. And occasionally it will find me a better answer without having to go through all of the iterations of a, of a multi-start with lots of runs. For table flute, uh, I will never do less than 10 multi-starts. Um, takes a takes a while for the computer to crank through through 10 or, or, or so of those iterations. So do 10 and see if your best solution shows up in more than one line in the um, in the starts. And if it does, you you've likely used too many starts, but that's the way of calibrating how many starts to do. Does that answer your question? I only use multi-start yep. when I have to, and the only uh -huh. parameter that, that really uh, effectively slices up um, those individual starts um, is the bore length. So before you, before you do the multi-start, make sure that you narrow down um, the bore length upper and lower bounds so that you get better slices, smaller slices. Got it. Um, now, is there any disadvantage to setting that number high other than a lot of thumb twiddling as the computer's cranking through all of these? Nope, won't make any mistakes. Okay, so you're still going to, it's still going to present you with the optimal result either yes. way. It's not going to yep. go off, off the rails on you. Um, um, and if you have a design that you're pretty close to, it sounds like you don't want to set it to multi-start if you're refining it because it's going to go back to square one and ignore the flute that you have? Correct. It won't use that as a start. Okay. <laughs> I've gotten pretty darn close on things and then had them disappear on me. So. And, and if you change your constraints, so that say you change your constraints for the diameter of, of hole one, and you say it's it, it can only be up to 0.4 inches, and your flute had that hole at 0.5 inches, um, it's going to, to modify your start. It won't be the same flute as you have here. Mm -hmm. It will change that um, hole size to be within the constraints. That's the first thing it mm -hmm. does is it normalizes the values so that they don't break the constraints. Okay, great. That's really helpful. Okay, other questions? Or was that there? 
Can we use one of my examples on a uh, comparing a standard cutoff flute with a directional hole flute? Okay. So you, what? So what exactly is the question? Okay, I, I've got a. Uh, I'm designing a uh, C5. Okay, six holes, baby. And uh, it's a, a, a single bore with a hemi head. Okay. And uh, the fipple factor on that was uh, 0.86. Okay, a wide open flute, or you were blowing it hard. Of course, it's uh, it's uh, longer than necessary. So that's before the um, the direction holes are in it. Right. <laughs> And the uh... hey, Rick. Sorry, just saying hi to Rick. He just popped up on my screen. No. Oh. <laughs> okay, and and so what? So now you want to add direction holes to it? So the question. Well, I started out with no directional holes. Okay. And I just wanted to see what it came out to, and it came out to a perfectly tuned flute. Okay. It's 11.126 inches long. Um, then I tried it again with the directional holes. This, came, this thing came out to 12.35 inches long, and the holes are way too big, and it's just all over the place. Okay, so you, and, and it wasn't a chromatic flute, it was a. Uh, just a pentatonic uh, scale. It's a, just a pentatonic scale. So you realize that um, there's an infinite number of solutions for a six hole flute in a pen with just optimizing for the pentatonic notes. And unless you constrain those solutions with the constraints, um, it's just going to choose one. They're going to have all the same tuning um, deviation, which is zero. So you need to, to constrain pretty much everything unless you have more notes that you're going to get into. For example, yeah, I, did use, yeah, but, I really did too much of a constraint on any of them. So yep. So so you're just going to get a solution out of the infinite number of solutions that are there, and the the program doesn't know which one you want unless you constrain the solutions. And you can strain them by the whole spacing, and you oh, can strain them by the grouping, and you can strain them by the size. Yeah, well, I can strain them by the grouping. But not by the size. Not by the size. I let the size go. Yep, and that's and so you got holes that were bigger than you wanted, didn't you? Yes. Well, only on the one with the directional hole. The other solution came out fine. Maybe just by chance. Huh. But, um, and you have to tell in the, um, for the direction holes, where you want the direction holes to be. So that's another constraint. How far up the flute they, they're going, or how far down the flute they're going to be. Okay. Otherwise, oh, yeah, it's going to put them anywhere at once. No, oh, I added direction holes to it. <laughs> you added direction holes. Um, you you did did you let the program calculate the direction holes? So you had four more holes in the um, tuning file and two, the constraints. And two uh, two tuning uh, two direction holes. Okay. I used. So adding two directional holes, uh, gave it a size, and uh, which you start out with a rough position, and it determines what position to put it in. But you fix the size and the constraints, right? So if, if you want two um, 0.4 inch direction holes, you tell for those two holes that the lower bound and the upper bound are 0.4 inches. 
That's correct. Okay. I use 0.3, but that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you fix the size. You have to do some fix or it'll run them right off the, well, it'll yeah. run them in strange places. All right. And this thing came out all haywire. <laughs> came out way longer than it needed to be. And uh, the whole sizes were horrendous. So it, it way longer than it needed to be, meaning that if you wanted it shorter. Well, in other words, that the result was without directional holes was 11.126 inches. Okay. With, I know that with directional holes, it should come out a little bit longer than that. Well, they can come out any 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 length dependent upon the size of the direction holes. Okay. Change, change, make the direction holes 0.4 inches and watch it get shorter. Well, I made them 0.3, and what happened was it went out to 12.063. Okay. Whole inch longer. Well, when I'm in the with direction holes, I typically make them so they're about two inches longer than without direction holes. Well, I guess what I'm saying is the uh, my flute length to begin with uh, was 12 and a 16. So it went longer than the flute that I started with. You added direction holes to a flute that was already in tune? No, oh, no, no. Well, I'm starting from scratch. You want to go through one? Sure, let's go through one. It's kill all of the stuff that I have open. Like I say, I rarely do direction holes. So first I need to get a, create a tuning file. Oh, uh, okay, you don't have a C5? Not with direction holes. So let's see if I have, um, there's a C5 without direction holes. Let's bring that one up. And That's not what I wanted to do. There is an easy way of doing that. Because we put it in. And that's not the way. I was sure I made it absolutely trivial to add direction holes. Yeah, let's not do it that way. Let's go into the program. Let's open that tuning file. And that doesn't allow me to do it. Okay, so let's just make one. Let's see if I have...
Don't have one. Nope, don't have one. So let's go back and make one. You doing more than one sharp? I mean, more than one octave? Uh, no. Yeah, let's do it. Again. Okay. So C5 to C6, right? That's correct. Okay. And you said you were only doing, um, well, we're going to put all this in and then we delete so that the temperaments line up. Okay. Well, now we have all the temperaments. Let's get rid of all these guys. There is that. And we have an A5. So A5, and let's set that to 880. So there was an answer to somebody's question. What do you do if you don't have an A4? We don't have an A4 on this flute. Okay, we want to make it simple and not make it chromatic or? Yeah. Okay. So I'm just holding the control key down while I'm clicking on the notes I don't want. Okay, now we have just a one octave C scale starting on C5 with those frequencies. I'm not gonna create a fingering pattern. And we want two direction holes, right? So we have eight holes total. Correct? Right. Right. And select them all. Put them all in. Okay. Fingering pattern. Simple. Let's see. You... Oh, isn't the second note the scale uh, D sharp? Yeah, we made a uh, a major scale. Let's go back and 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 do your minor scale. So we're good with the scale symbols. We're good with the music temperament. We are good here. We are good. Here, so we just push this button again, <laughs> and so we have three flats or three sharps on this baby. So we don't have this guy and this guy. E flat, F, A flat, O A. B flat, no B, correct? Did I get that right? Yep. C, E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, C. Perfect. Okay, that look better to you? Yep, life is good. Okay.
Just a left heel field question here for you, Ed. Uh, I noticed that on your standard fingering chart that you have the top two holes open for the second octave notes. Yes. And and that, and that's not conventional compared to what most makers I know do, where they only have the top hole open. Yes. And I'm just curious uh, how, how you came to that. Sounds better. Does it? <laughs> yep. It's ergonomically, it's better for going for the octave because if you're at the octave and then going to those upper notes, you don't have to put any fingers down. I don't know if you can hear that. I think the tone quality is better with it open. Mm -hmm. And I've gone back and forth in the years that I've been making flutes or a big A flute. It's just cleaner sound. Uh-huh. So it doesn't uh, have a major impact on the on the actual tunability of those not, notes? Not for that that note. Uh-huh. That so on the in, instead on the um, major second octave, it changes the tuning a little bit on the on the minor mm -hmm. third, it doesn't really. It's about 15 cents difference there. So it's, it's, it's for tone quality. And it may vary uh -huh. with your flutes um, compared to mine. Uh -huh. Just play your flutes and see which fingering you like best. It'll kind okay. of play either one. Okay, so we're going back here. Tell me when I make a mistake. Okay, I've missed a note. Oh, I have two C6s. Yeah, C6, six, six. <laughs> Does that look correct, everybody? That'll work. Okay, so we'll give it a name. I'm in the right spot this time. Okay. So let's add that in, give it a look. There it is. Okay, that looked all right to you. So now let's bring up a, f a flute. I use a five-eighths bore. Okay. So it told us I brought, just brought up a six-hole flute for a eight-hole tuning. So let's add some holes. Okay, I don't care what that is, so let's 
make it nine inches. And you said you were making nine inches. And let's just use this same. Um, Okay, so there's a flute, and we don't worry about any of the four constraints or anything like that. I used a, uh, a proposition of minus uh, an eighth. That's okay. Do you think that matters? I think we can do that. And then I used a uh, semi head. Uh, semi head. Okay. There we go. Okay. So here's what that flute looks like. Okay. Now we don't know anything about it yet for tuning. Um, now we need to bring up some constraints. And there won't be any. So if I do open constraints, I won't find any eight hole flutes. I can do a create default constraints. It won't find anything there, so it'll just create blank constraints. Okay, and there it is, blank constraints. Let's do this, so you have to fill this out. Let's do it 8 to 16 inches. And let's do that 0.25 to 5. And I have big fingers, so I never set my whole distances less than 0.8 inches. Okay, and five, four, four to three. Um, I don't care what that is for minimum. Okay, direction hole distance to direction hole. Let's make it um, just for minimum. And between the direction holes, let's leave that as zero. We want them right on top of each other, right? That's right. Let's go to the top of the list. Okay. Why do I have to do this? What, an inch or an inch and a quarter, something like this? Oh, uh, yeah, inch and an eighth, I think I used. Um, I can use inch and a quarter, that's fine. Yeah, it should never do that to an inch and a quarter. Okay, distance there. Let's just make it three inches. I don't care. Three inches. And direction hole to there. Um, maximum. Do five inches. And also zero. Okay. Well, that's that section. Hole diameters, what do you want to constrain those to? Um, yeah, let's just make it 0.1 inches just so it's easy to type. Yeah. Okay, and you saw so this to be in three inches, right? For the direction holes? Sorry, you get a point three, yes. 
Okay. And maximum diameter of a hole, probably, let's do a 0.4. It shouldn't need 0.4. No, that's, I think that's what I use. Oh, we wanted the direction holes to be um, 0.3, right? Yep. So, fixed size of direction holes. Okay, does that all look proper? It does. Okay. Now we have a flute and a constraint, and of course, if we minimize it, it's going to look like crap. And it does. Okay. So we're just changing hole size and position. We're going to hit the optimizer, and let's make sure I didn't do multi start on this still. We're okay there. And we're not going to do a multi start there. It should not be giving me an error. Should be able to optimize this perfectly. Well, the only difference on mine is I had a different fipple factor. What did you want for your fipple factor? 0.86. And before I delete things, let's name this constraints file. Now I won't delete it. Okay, let's run the optimizer again. And change you, to change your FIPPLE factor back to 7, 0.75. Ah, that's right. I put it in the wrong wrong guy. Point eight six, right? Okay, error is essentially zero. Average uh, two point two three cents. And let's see what the flute looks like. There's the flute. Kind of ugly. <laughs> yeah, because we haven't put constraints on it. Um, and it's 11.358 inches long. Oh, that's it. And and so what's ugly about it is these bottom holes, which are so big, and let's set them to be smaller. How's that? That's what the constraints are for. Uh, one other thing. Yes. <clears throat> If I want to keep the same length of the flute that I did the uh, flute, twelve point oh six three inches, and I plug that in your range there on the constraints. Which what did you want to change? The bore length. The bore length, yeah, sure. Plug it in. Twelve point oh six three. Twelve point oh six three. Is 
Is that what you wanted? No. Okay. Um, let's change the holes so that they're only L. Point three is still pretty ugly, but let's do point three. Okay, hey, does that still all look all right? Okay, let's start with that guy again. Okay, even better. So, essentially zero error. Average deviation of one cent, and let's see what it looks like. Much better. So you have to play with the constraints. Yeah, take that. Is there a way of um, constraining the direction hole location? to an absolute place uh, on the barrel of the flute. No. What I'm thinking of, um, so if we wanted to put it in a specific location relative to an end cap or something for aesthetic reasons, we'd have to model that you, uh, you, manually. Yeah, you'll have to play with that. You, you have the same issue um, when you want a taper to be started or stopped in a certain position. Um, there's no good way of putting in absolute values because the program is built to try to manipulate those values. It doesn't uh -huh. know what an absolute value is, in fact. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I fight that all the time, to tell you the truth. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so, we kind of solved your problem with that flute, didn't we? Yeah, I was just, uh, I don't understand why it wouldn't pick right off the bat, even though I didn't constrain the hole sizes, why wouldn't it give me a zero or closer to a, a perfect flute on its own? Well, but its tuning error was zero, wasn't it? That's all it knows is tuning error. And unless you set the constraints, it's just going to give you the best tuning that it can find. Um, and it doesn't know which one to choose if there's more than one. That's what the constraints are for. Okay. All right, looks good. Thank you. Um, other questions? Ed. Yes, sir. This is Rick. Um, hey, Rick. I pretty much consistently, not pretty much, I consistently use groupings of the top three and bottom three holes. Okay. And. I consistently can get in the range of maybe three to six as the uh, sense uh, okay. in, um, in checking the flute, but I'm almost always consistently on hole two when I'm fine. I always tune chromatically. Okay. On hole two, almost always there's a 10 or 11 cent difference, and I have to, I always make my holes. Uh, uh, 30 seconds smaller than whatever the software says, but I always have to move the second hole south and undercut the south side to be able to get the two notes in tune, which I can always do, but it's pretty consistent that they're off. Um, Is that just, I mean, I'm not complaining because I can fix that, but what happens with hole three is the, it's a tonic note, as they call it, the uh, jazz note. Uh -huh. By the time I'm through with the flute, it is always sharp, and sometimes it's like 30 cents sharp. Okay, I don't know if you can see, well, you're not going to be able to see this flute. You've picked out the two holes that are um, the real killer for chromatic flutes. Um, hole number three and hole number five. If you look at my flutes where I, I get those notes in tune, 
I angle hole number three up as much as I can, usually at least 45 to 50 degrees up to get that in tune. I angle um, hole six, as you've described, down. Um, Five down. At least at least 30 to, to 45 degrees. And then I still have to go in with riffler files and double the inside edges. Um, I'm thinking about in, in flutes as I go forward, not to worry about the jazz note. And the reason why you don't have to worry about the jazz note is traditionally Nobody. <laughs> that note was not played as a separate fingering. It was always played as a bend. So we're talking, you know, back in the 1700s when it came in and, and probably um, early this century when it was recognized what was happening. Instead of playing, it was played, it was rolled in instead of played as a separate note. So it can be played in tune as a half hole. Um, if you don't, if you do the, the separate fingering, um, it's going to drive your layout. It's going to drive your error. And so maybe it's not worth doing. I'm still still fighting that because all of my whole layouts have been driven um, by those two notes. Well, I understand your pain. Program half holding. What's that? Program half hole. Yeah, you can, but it's if you know that. The and, and we discussed this a little bit before you came. In. Uh, if you know that that note is a half, just don't include it in the tuning, and just play it half whole. That's one way. The second way is um, put another note there, constrained to be in the same spot as the, as the the note that it the whole that it represents and um, use it for your half hole tuning. Okay. You can do either one. It's just, if you're doing half holing, it's just not, not worth making it part of the solution. As long as you're convinced that you can do the half hole um, and, and get the note in tune. Yeah, I generally don't worry about the, the jazz note. Other than, you know, like you said, undercut as much as you can, and then where it ends up, it ends up, and then you just play it with a half hole. And, and the reason why I worry about it is, and this also came up before, yes, I'm anal, <laughs> but more because when I pick up a flute, say uh, an A flute, I don't always play in the key of A. I may play in the key of B. Um, I may play in the key B major, not B minor, um, that sort of thing. So I really want all the notes there. And, and so it distresses me if I have to figure out a half holing, which isn't going to sound perfect um, when I'm doing a fast run. So that's my bent on it. So, so if we can go back to uh, the whole angling you do, I, I haven't played with angling holes at all. I do plenty of undercutting. Um, on holes three and five, you angle them from the top of the hole towards the mouthpiece. So three, I angle toward the mouthpiece, and five, I angle toward the foot. Okay. And you said about 45 degrees is ideal? Well, no, you're going to have to work that out. And I work uh, that out uh, by um, taking off the constraints for equal spacing and see where they want to be. Ah. Because wh where that hole is on the inside of the flute is where the tuning is affected. And um, given that you're, you're changing the geometries here a little, um, uh, do you make any adjustments in terms of ideal 
uh, di hole diameter as you're doing that. So I start really small because when I drill at that angle, when you look at it straight down, it does mm -hmm. not make a round hole. It makes an oval hole. And I, right. by eye, make it round. And then I finish the undercutting. So I do all that with rifflers and, and with little dowels um, with sandpaper around them and things like that. It takes me forever mm -hmm. to, to shape one of those holes <laughs> and tune it. Mm -hmm. And the when you're tuning that hole, which tunes for two, two different notes, the two different notes come into tune at different speeds. So you have to be a little careful. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know what angle to, to do them by um, when I do my optimizations based upon how far I really would like to move them off of the even spacing. Uh, layout and I, I don't ever try to drill on more than 45 degrees so uh -huh. uh, that third hole often wants to be more than 45 degrees so i spent a lot of time with with bent rifter file uh, cutting it even more undercutting it even more which for you know some of my favorite really hard woods it's a real pain in the ass <laughs> to get those things that are cut by hand. Yeah. Do, do, when, when you're crafting these, do you start from the underside of the flute? No, the you know flute is already going to be by then. Uh huh. Okay, so you, you don't do any pre drilling for undercutting or anything I like don't, that? Don't pre drill okay. at all because I don't know what the uh -huh. okay. factor is for that flute. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the last word go ahead. Yeah, Dave Eckert here. I've got to drop out, so uh, I just want to say thank you very much for your presentation here, and I learned a lot. Thank you. And if you have other questions, um, it wasn't too painful on my part to put together, so we could do this again. Hey, sounds great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dave. Hey, there were more questions out there. Yeah, I have a question for you. I Certainly. have a. Dip I cannot um toggle the window panes i can't make them free floating they're just fixed they will not move i was wondering if it's the version of java java that i'm using that's causing that problem what version are you using the latest version of java well is it latest version of java 9 10 11 or 12. <laughs> <laughs> well when's the last time they updated java they so the, what's happened for the, for those that aren't aware is Oracle, which took over from Sun, the Java distributions and the and the maintenance and all of that, changed their licensing paradigm. Up through Java eight, um, it was totally free with no restrictions and updated and all of that. Java 9 and above essentially became a developer platform, which if you bundled it with your software, you needed to license it through Oracle. And they, they kind of follow different paths as far as the internals of the software. Uh, I'm a developer. I, I have access to, to all of those versions. Mm -hmm. You're probably running Java 8. Is that true or not true? I think it's probably what I'm running because it's the latest free version available. And, and it updates, um, it, it tweaks you on your, inner, on your um, window to, to update your Java every once in a while, right? And it hasn't done right. it in a while. <laughs> yep. Um, so when I free float, so I'm on my screen again. You see where my cursor is? Can you see my cursor? Yes. Do you see that little box with an arrow? Yeah. It, and, and now the, the tool tip says toggle floating. Right. Does yours do the same thing, toggle floating? Um, I actually just went up into, I think it's either the Windows tab where it says toggle floating. I've worked from there. 
and that's where I where it says toggle. <laughs> no, that toggle that of you is something very different. Oh, uh, okay, and that's why I'm not able to do that then. Yes, you have to go down to the icon for any particular window and click that toggle floating button, and then you get that. Okay. And it remembers the size of the last time you did it. Notice how big it is compared to the first time I did that, and it was small. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the toggle floating. You can do the same thing with editor windows, and I'll often do that if I'm playing with tunings. So here's the tuning, and I'll go over, um, let's see. I think I just drag it. Nope. It's been a while since I've. This should also rip off. Hmm, I wonder if they changed that. Ah, there it is. I right click on the tab and it says okay. floating. And now it's floating. I can move it off here. Okay and play with it um so i so it's fully accessible while i have something else on here and then i right click it again and i dock it all right yeah that helps out quite a bit so what you're doing when you um go to window and toggle that of you this is in the innards of the the software this looks like it's the data. And when we created it in the tuning file, it looked like the data. This is not what the, the program is data. Um, this is what the program thinks is data. It's XML, mm -hmm. it's a text file. Um, and that text file generates the data view. Um, this button up here does the same thing. It does the data view. Okay. There's still some times where I have occasion to go out and manipulate this data view here, but you guys should never have to do that. All right. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Um, just out of curiosity, really. Um, when I looked at the XML file for the zero holes, yes, uh, for, for Fipple Factor, yes, I didn't see anything that was said in there. Um, did, did I miss something that you know, that there must be some adjustment that were, is taking place? So, or are all the so I or only have the adjustment one, with your host? I only say one of those guys. Let me open one and let's see what what we're doing. And it's not in the normal directories. So here's here's where I have have all my junk just external. Mm -hmm. And there should be a here it is a no hole tuning. Okay, no hole tuning with a frequency. And if I look at the XML. There's the note with the name and the and the frequency. Uh, no, I think I was looking at the constraints on this to see what because it's it's if there's no holes in the flute, it 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 naturally comes in a little flat. Oh yeah, there are no, just, the the only constraint in the Fipple factor is um, let's bring up a flute. And it's going to yell at me. Let's just get rid of all the <laughs> holes. Okay, now we have a perfectly respectable flute. Um, and now I'm going to open up the default constraint or open up a constraint. Zero holes XML. 
and all it has is the fipple factor in there. That's the only variable. The, the tuning, the actual tuning of that note isn't a constraint. It's uh -huh, input okay. data. The, so constraints are variables that the program, the optimizer is going to change as it, it's coming up with the, the new design. It's not going to change a fixed value, which is the tuning that you measured for that um, no hole. So it's a tuning uh, file, well, not in the constraints. The, the, the reason why I, why I asked is to understand the difference between a, an undrilled flute that has no holes and a drilled flute that is going to go a little bit flatter because of the presence uh, of those holes. Where, where is that adjustment made? Is that just integral to the holes themselves? So uh, what, what's in, in saying is, file was is if I take this, let's get rid of this starter flute and re-implement it. Okay, so now we have a six hole flute and a tuning file that matches a six hole flute. I can do a fipple factor from an existing flute. In fact, I recommend you do it um, so that you know what your historical flutes are like. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. When I do that, um, the constraint isn't, isn't going to change. It still only has um, fipple factor as its variable. It's going to come along, it's going to calculate this flute with all the holes, with all of the closed hole constraints, and it's going to find the lowest note in your tuning file. And it's going to right. calculate the FIPPLE factor based upon the frequency of this lowest note, which hopefully is all holes closed. And so that's the one you want to measure. So if I measure this flute and it's 440, I put that number in there. I can edit that. And then I do the optimization um, for FIPPLE factor. And it will calculate the FIPPLE factor just based upon that lowest note. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that answer your question? But it takes into um, account all the other holes that are closed when, when it does that calculation. But I'll get a different number if I do this with a, an undrilled flute versus using the zero hole um, uh, uh, test um, tuning. I would postulate, um, and I haven't tried it recently, that you'll get exactly the same FIPPLE factor because the frequency you measure for either the all holes closed or for no holes at all will be a different frequency. And it exactly will compensate for that FIPPLE factor. And so the FIPPLE factor should be the same. Interesting. Okay. So I. Typically on a flute, having all the holes drilled or having no holes drilled is going to be on the order of about 12 cents, depending on the size of mm -hmm. your flute. I would estimate then that your um, the tuning after you've drilled the holes and covered all of them with your fingers and blood will be 12 cents lower than the one without holes. Okay, that that's a good rule of thumb to know. So if um, so, I don't want to use this file for which presumes drilled holes with an undrilled flute. I really I want to go back to one that has zero holes in it and just get the fipple factor from that if I can. Well, it should be the same. If 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 you're mm, stuck right. mm. with um, you have a new you're going to make a a flute based upon some geometry that you've never made before, but you have a flute in hand with that geometry, definitely measure the fickle factor from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. Other questions? Mm -hmm. 
Well, we haven't even started <laughs> on board tapers and oh. uh, it, it, it shows like that. I, I assume that at this stage, we probably want to set up a different Yeah, I uh, think so. You were uh, also a conference for that too, weren't you, Rick? Board tapers. Is Rick still here? Nope. Hey, he see seems him, to right? be off my list. Yep. I don't see him either. It's just you and Lee. Yeah, I mean, I, I've made some things that tune beautifully based on the program and are some of the worst sounding flutes I've ever heard. Um, uh, tremendous problems with overblowing if that uh, taper is somewhere in the in the top three holes. Exactly. Uh, on the flat. There. Man, I, I'm just, I'm not going anywhere near that again. On the other hand, I found that uh, some of the best flutes I've made have uh, a very short, wide bore right at the sound hole, and within an inch to an inch and a half, they choke down and are cylindrical to the end. Um, and and I love the tone I've gotten out of some of those. So um, this is a, an A flute. Um, a low A flute. I mean, it's a it's a bass flute. Notice how reasonable the whole spacing is. It's chromatically tuned. The second octave notes are in tune. You can't do this without a bore taper. Uh, I, I'm sorry to interrupt here, but you you blanked out on me. I think it was probably a local internet thing on my end. Can you start over? Yeah, I couldn't see you either. It was it had a uh, a warning message saying bad connection um okay my internet still looks good uh, but it, it flakes every once in a while it's very fast but so this is an a a3 flute um notice the whole spacing i constrained it to 1.4 inches because most people can reach 1.4 inches um it's chromatically tuned the couple of octaves in this couple of notes in the second octave are in tune. Um, and you can't build a flute like this without a bore taper. And but I can strain the tapers either to start somewhere up above the top three holes or between the third and the fourth hole. And I can strain my taper to to end below the bottom hole and go all the way to the end, but it's constrained not to, to in, impinge here or here because you can hear the difference in sound. The other thing that happens is you cannot. I can't. Tapers are bigger at the top, smaller at the bottom. I have a couple of flutes here in my bone pile that I tried to push it um, and have a little smaller at the top and larger at the bottom. They sound like crap. Yeah. So th there is not enough pressure in these kinds of open ended flutes with the big bore diameters that I use um, to sustain a good tone with what I call a reverse taper. Um, so that's that's one thing you want to do in your constraints. That is a setting. But now, I mean, this this flute sounds just fine. In fact, in fact it sounds great. very easily not too long to stick in my mouth so I probably make at least 95% if not more of my flutes with a taper mm -hmm. but you have to 
be concerned where you put them if you miss them, you know, and they're a pain to do. Now, um, you, you also tend towards flutes with uh, a, a pretty wide bore. Uh, if one is looking at, say, you know, 18, 19, 20 to 1 ratio, um, might you do better with those reverse tapers? Don't know. Haven't tried. Um, my next mm -hmm. set of flutes will drop closer down to the traditional 18 to 1. I don't use mm -hmm. a, a fixed ratio. I use a, um, it's actually an NA flutomat, one of the um, the algorithms in that for doing bore taper. It's it's based upon the the area of the bore, not at not the diameter to get a constant mm -hmm. aspect ratio. Um, so my deeper flutes have a a, a lower um, bore to to length aspect ratio than my my higher flutes. My higher flutes are downright fat. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this thing probably, well, it's an inch and a quarter bore at the bottom, and, and the bottom is what I um, determine um, that that aspect ratio for. Uh, it's the one that matters for timbre. Most uh -huh. every every flute just sounds sounds fine when you um, start opening the bottom two holes. So it's it's the bottom note that the bottom two notes that are are really the drivers. Um, my A flutes are probably oh sixteen seventeen to one, and again. A's you can get almost straight and, and get chromatically tuned, but and they're all in tune within five cents. But has a taper in it. So we we can at our next session go through how to optimize for tapers, where to put it, um, warts that that make it kind of a pain to determine where the start points and end points are for that taper. Um, it can all be done. Great. Well, thank you very much for this. You've certainly helped make uh, uh, sheltering in place much more livable. <laughs> yeah, I finally cleaned up my shop after a couple of years, so it's time to go. Yeah, I, I, have, I haven't been isolated that long yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Okay. All right, thank hey, you, Ed. I appreciate thank all you. your time. Bet. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.